Hello, this is Mr. Field, and this is my video on diffusion, osmosis, and active transport. Now, before you watch this video, make sure you're confident on the basics of animal, plant, and bacterial cells, and you can check out a video earlier in the playlist if you need to review that stuff. Now, in this video, we are going to look at concentration, then we'll look at diffusion, osmosis. We'll see how osmosis applies in plant cells and animal cells, and then we'll look at the osmosis core practical before finishing with active transport. So we're going to start by looking at the idea of concentration because concentration underpins just about everything that follows in the rest of this video. Now concentration is the number of particles of a solute dissolved in a given volume of solution. Now this word solute um, means dissolved substance. So concentration is just the amount of a substance dissolved in a given volume of a solution. In everyday language, we might think of this as being the strength of a solution. We've got to be very careful about using that word strength, though, because that has very specific meanings in science. So we need to say concentration rather than strength. So don't write this in the exam, but do have that in the back of your head. Um, you know, we've all uh, maybe had some Ribena or orange squash or something like that at some point in our lives. And when we say it's too strong, like this one here, we mean it's really concentrated. That's the actual word we should use. If we said the Ribena was too weak, like this one, we, would, we should really say it's got a low concentration. And we make these different concentrations of Ribena just by changing the amount of Ribena that we pour into our glass. So it's got more of the Ribena and less of the water that we're diluting it with. Okay. Now, concentration can be increased by two things. One is increasing the number of particles that we've got present in our solution. And the second is by decreasing the volume that those particles are spread over. And we're going to look at a couple of examples of this now. Um, now, when we do this, I'm going to refer to the number of particles as capital N and the volume as V uh, for reasons that you'll see in a second. So let's look at a medium concentration. Now these two solutions here, uh, or, or boxes here rather, both show the same concentration. Now you might say, well, the one on the right has got more particles. Yes, it has, but it's also got double the volume. So although the um, number of particles has been doubled, the volume has also doubled. So we've still got the same number of particles per volume and so the concentration is the same. So what about if we wanted to increase the concentration? Well, we could do this. We could either have the same number of particles in half the volume. So the, part, so the particles are the same, it's just times one, but the volume is times half. That could be a, a higher concentration. Or we could do what's happened here, where we've kept the volume the same, but the number of particles has doubled. So either increasing the number of particles or decreasing the volume increases the concentration. And you can tell that these have got higher concentration because the particles are closer together. And what about to reduce the concentration? Well, we could keep the number of particles say, the same, but increase the volume. So here, my number of particles is five in each one, um, but my volume has doubled. Or we could keep the volume the same, but half the number of particles. So here, the number of particles compared to that top box is half what it is in the bottom box, is double what it is in the bottom box, and the volume is the same. And so again, you can see in both these cases, either by um, increasing the volume or halving the number of particles, the concentration has decreased. And again, you can see that just by looking at how far apart the particles are. These are more spread out, therefore the concentration is lower. Now, the last thing to think about on this is the idea of the concentration gradient. Now, a concentration gradient is simply when you've got an area of higher concentration right next to an area of lower concentration. And we've got that situation here. We've got higher concentration on the left and lower concentration on the right. And so we call that a concentration gradient. And the concentration gradient is sloping from high concentration on the right to low concentration on the left. That's going to be really important as we talk through more stuff to do with osmosis diffusion and active transport in just a second. Now, diffusion. 
Diffusion is the movement of particles from high concentration to low concentration down the concentration gradient. That's just our fancy way of saying from high to low concentration. Now, diffusion happens as a result of the many random movements of millions and billions of particles. So the point of saying this is that it's not that the particles are repelling each other. There's no kind of mysterious force pushing them apart. It just occurs due to the, the uh, sort of millions of motions uh, and collisions of millions of individual particles. Um, one way perhaps to visualize this, you know, imagine you're a farmer and you've got a big field like that. And in one little corner of the field, you've got a pen containing some sheep. A pen is like a little box containing some sheep. Okay. Now, if you open the gate to that little sheep pen, what you'll find is that the sheep will just naturally start moving around. It's not that they're afraid of each other. They just, you know, all just move into a bit of space and, you know, find themselves some nice fresh grass to eat. And then over time, eventually, what you'll find, if that was before and this is the after, if that's where my pen was, you'll find that afterwards, the sheep have just naturally kind of spread themselves out. Um, and if you came back at any random time, there's no point at which the sheep would have magically gathered back into that bottom left-hand corner. They will just stay naturally spread out. That's kind of the way that diffusion works. There's no overall driving force. It is just that over time, as they collide and move into each other and bounce off each other enough times, they just end up spreading out. Now, diffusion takes place until there is no longer a concentration gradient. At that point, once the concentration is completely equal, there's no overall movement of particles uh, any longer. Now, let's look at uh, a couple of illustrations. So this first one, we've got a high concentration of purples on the left and a low concentration of purples on the right. And so the direction of diffusion will be from high to low concentration. So from left to right in this case. And it will stop once we get to this kind of situation where the particles are now evenly spread out. There's no concentration gradient. So now diffusion will stop. What about a second example? Now in this one, we've got a high concentration on the right, or maybe we should say higher concentration on the right and a lower concentration on the left. So we'd expect diffusion to take place from right to left in this case, down the concentration gradient. And that is what happens. And again, it will continue until the concentration of particles on the left and the right is equal. And at that point, there's no overall movement. There will be some particles going from right to left and some particles going from left to right, but the numbers will cancel each other out. And so there's no overall movement. Now, diffusion is passive. That means it requires no energy. This is something that just happens because of the movements of those particles, but it doesn't need energy to drive it forwards. In terms of examples, there are a few important ones. So in humans, in our lungs, um, oxygen diffuses from the lungs into our blood. You can see that happening here. So this, this uh, little sort of um, blue circle thing is called an alveolus, and that is a little air sac. Um, and we have millions of those in our lungs. And what happens is the oxygen in the air diffuses from the lungs into the blood. Equally, the waste carbon dioxide in our blood diffuses from the blood and back out into the lungs. OK, so we've got two types of diffuse or two um, substances diffusing between our blood and our lungs. Similarly, with plants, um, oxygen diffuses from plant leaves into the air. That's what's being shown here. Um, and equally, uh, carbon dioxide diffuses from the air into plants and leaves. And that carbon dioxide is used for photosynthesis. And that oxygen is the waste produced from photosynthesis. Now, before we look at osmosis, we need to put some background knowledge into place. The first key idea we're going to look at is the idea of a partially permeable membrane. Now, this word permeable is about whether substances can pass through the membrane and partially is just a fancier word for partly. So a partially permeable membrane is a membrane that water can easily pass through, but dissolved substances cannot pass through. Another word for this that you might meet in different places is a semi permeable membrane. Now, importantly, cell membranes are partially permeable membranes. 
and we can see that here so here we've got our partially permeable membrane which is in fact actually a cell membrane and you can see that in it it's got these little channels there that allow substances to pass through now these small water molecules are easily able to pass through those narrow channels but these large solute molecules these dissolved substances are too big to fit through those channels and so they can't pass through so this makes it partially permeable the membrane is permeable to the water but impermeable to the solute molecules and those solute molecules could be salt or sugar or proteins or all sorts of other different substances now the second kind of key idea to look at is the idea of water concentration now we normally talk about concentration in terms of the number of solute particles in a given volume of solution but we can also talk about it in terms of the amount of water particles as well and the key thing here is that when the when there's a lower concentration of solute of dissolved particles there must then be a higher concentration of water particles and we can see that on the left hand side here on the left hand side there is a low solute concentration in fact there's a zero solute concentration because there are no reds and so therefore there is a high water concentration because that's all we've got we've only got the blue water particles and then equally on the right hand side when we've got a higher solute concentration there will be a lower water concentration and we can see that here we can see that because we've got lots of these red solute particles we've got that higher solute concentration that means there is less space for the water so there are fewer water molecules and therefore there is a lower water concentration so now we're ready to look at osmosis itself osmosis is the diffusion of water and only water across a partially permeable membrane and we can see the setup here we can see that we've got on the left hand side a load of water molecules and on the right hand side a load of solute and water molecules and they're separated by this partially permeable membrane now in osmosis water moves from higher water concentration which is lower solute concentration to lower water concentration which is higher solute concentration so in this example because we've got lower solute concentration on the left we've also therefore got higher water on the left and on the right we've got higher solute concentration the red ones and therefore we've got lower water concentration so what's happening is the water is diffusing from high water concentration to low water concentration and so the, dir the direction of the osmosis in this example is from left to right now the solute particles do want to, dif to diffuse from high to low for them as well but the trouble is they can't pass through the channels in the partially permeable membrane because they are too big and so it's only the water that is able to move now osmosis will continue until the water concentration on either side of the membrane is the same and you can see that situation here now you can see how there are roughly similar proportions of blue particles on the left and on the right of that diagram and so now osmosis stops now all movement of water in and out of cells is by osmosis and importantly osmosis as far as you're concerned is only ever to do with the movement of water so anytime you see a question about the movement of water in or out of cells it's always a question on osmosis now we're going to look at um, how you can predict the direction of osmosis first of all in plant cells and on the next slide we'll look at animal cells so let's say we take some plant cells and we put them in a hypotonic solution that means we've got a lower solute concentration in the solution that also therefore means we've got a higher water concentration so what happens then in this case is that the water concentration is higher outside the cells because we've got a low solute concentration outside the cells so that means that water will enter the cells by osmosis and the cells will swell up the word for that is that they become turgid or swollen um, and we can see that here see the way that the walls of that cell are sort of curving outwards as it's filling up with water and it's becoming swollen 
Now this is the kind of healthy, happy state of a plant cell. This gives a plant cell support um, and enables, enables the, um, the, uh, the plant to stand tall. Compare that to a, when you put the plant cells in a hypertonic solution. That is one with a higher solute concentration, which means that we've got a low water concentration. So what this means now is that the water concentration is now higher inside the cells and lower outside the cells. So what will happen is the water will leave the cells now by osmosis and those cells will start to shrivel up and shrink a bit. And what we say is the cells become flaccid, which is the scientific term for floppy. And we can actually see the cytoplasm starting to shrink away from the cell wall. See, see that patch there and that patch there where the cytoplasm is peeling away from that yellow cell wall. That cell is not firm and rigid and is kind of all sad and floppy. And you can, t you can see this in plants when their cells are flaccid. The whole plant starts to kind of droop. We say it wilts. Um, and that is not how plant cells want to be. So plant cells do much better when they're in a hypotonic solution so that they can swell up and they can support themselves with all that, with all that water. Now with animal cells, we'll see that osmosis um, can have a slightly different effect. Now, the kind of happy state for an animal cell is to be in an isotonic solution. In an isotonic solution, the water and solute concentrations are the same inside and outside the cell, something like this. Now, this means there's going to be no overall movement of water in or out of the cell because the water concentration is equal both inside and outside, and so there's no water concentration gradient. Now, similar to with plant cells, if we place these in a hypertonic solution, that means the water concentration will be lower outside the cells, and therefore, water will leave the cells by osmosis and the cells will become flaccid and they will sort of shrivel up and become all floppy and sad looking. Now the difference, the big difference here is with what happens when you're in a hypotonic solution. Now a hypotonic solution is one where the solute concentration outside the cells is lower and therefore the water concentration outside the cells is higher. Now with plant cells this was a good thing because it means that water enters the cell and the cell swells and gets supported by the cell wall and that makes the cell firm and strong. But in this case, whilst water does still enter the cell by osmosis, because there is no cell wall to strengthen the cell, the cells can swell and then burst. And we can see that happening here and here. And a burst cell is a dead cell. So a hypotonic solution can be very dangerous for animal cells. So now let's look at the osmosis core practical. Now the aim of this core practical was to investigate the effect of the concentration of sucrose solution on the percentage mass change of some potato chips. So the concentration of the sucrose solution, that was our independent variable because that was the thing that we were changing. And the percentage mass change, that was the dependent variable because that's the thing that we were measuring. And you might be wondering what sucrose solution is. Sucrose solution is just a sugar solution. Now, what we did in this experiment was, first of all, we cut four potato chips of similar size and we blotted them dry, first of all. Now, the four potato chips should be from the same potato, just to ensure that we're really controlling the necessary variables. We then weighed each chip and recorded the mass. And then we placed each chip in sucrose solutions of either 0%, that's pure water, 40%, 60%, or 80%. Those are our different concentrations. And we left it for 15 minutes. And you can see that set up there. So you can see each of the different potato chips in the water, so in the solutions with different concentrations, 0, 40, 80, and 100%. And then after 15 minutes, so hopefully once there's been enough time for um, osmosis to take place, we then removed each chip and we blotted them dry and we measured and recorded their masses again. Blotting them dry is important. This improves the accuracy because it means that we're only weighing the chip itself and not any of the solution that might be on the surface of the chip. 
also important to make sure that we are controlling the time. We keep that as a controlled variable because if we do them for different lengths of time, we couldn't tell if it was the concentration that was changing the um, results or if it was the time that was changing the results. Now, in terms of stuff, we've got something that looked like this. We had the concentration of sucrose solution. We had the initial mass of each chip and the final mass of each chip. And we then had to do a couple of little bits of analysis. The first thing to do was to calculate the change in mass. Super easy. The mass change was just the final mass take away the initial mass. And we got these results here. Now, when we did that, you can see that some of the results are positive. So our chip in 0% sucrose solution increased in mass. But then actually most of them were negative. Most of them decreased in mass. And then the final thing we did was we calculated the percentage mass change. So what we did was the percentage change is the final mass, take away the initial mass, divided by the initial mass, multiplied by 100. And if you do that, you get these here as your results. Now, we calculate percentage change because it allows for a fair comparison. Because the thing is, it's very difficult to cut potato chips that have the exact same starting mass. And that will mean that the actual final mass change will be different for each one. So by doing a percentage mass change, that lets us make comparisons, even though the chips didn't start at the exact same starting mass. Now, the last thing we did then was that we graphed our um, results. We graphed the percentage mass that was on the Y axis versus the sucrose concentration on the X axis. And we got results looking like that. And then we finally, we added a line of best fit as well. And that line of best fit, you can see is a straight line um, with a, uh, a, a negative slope. And you can see the results are pretty decent actually. You can see that you know they're not all perfectly on the line, but they're all pretty close to it, which tells me we've got quite reliable results there. Now, we might also find the isotonic point. This is the point where the concentration of sucrose or solute inside and outside is equal and therefore no osmosis takes place which means there's no mass change and that is the point here at which the line on the graph crosses the x-axis which you can see there is roughly around 22 percent now in terms of our results um, what can we see well the trend in our results is that the greater the sucrose concentration, the greater the decrease in mass. And we can describe that in a bit more detail. We can say that the trend is a negative linear correlation. In terms of why this happens, well, at lower sucrose concentration, the water concentration is higher outside the potato. So therefore, water will enter the potato by osmosis, moving from higher to lower concentration. And that causes the potato to increase in mass. And then at higher sucrose concentrations, the water concentration is higher inside the potato. So water leaves the potato by osmosis and the potato gets physically smaller and lighter because it's lost the water that was giving it some of the mass. And we can see what's happening uh, here and here. Now the last thing to look at is active transport. In the examples of diffusion and osmosis, we've seen substances moving from high to low concentration without requiring any energy. Active transport is the opposite. In active transport, substances move from lower concentration to higher concentration up the concentration gradient. Now, this is performed by proteins in the cell membrane that pump the substances into the cells. And this requires energy. That's why we call it active. The active part of active transport refers to the energy that's being used. Okay. Now, we're going to see this happening on this little animation on the right here. Now, just to kind of tee this up a little bit, and we've got a few things we're looking at. That big red sort of Pac-Man thing, that is our protein that functions like a pump. Um, and the purple um, things, these are our solute molecules. And lastly, we've got the, um, 
this sort of orange thing that's supposed to represent our cell membrane so you can see the way that that protein is sat within that cell membrane so let's see what happens now first of all a solute particle sort of moves into the protein pump and what we can see is this that that sort of orange spark here this bit that is called ATP and this is the um, this represents the energy that's being used by this process. You don't need to know the details. Just get the idea that that ATP, that is the energy that's being used by that protein to pump the solute. And so what happens is you can see the, pro the, um, the pump changes shape and it spits the solute out on the other side of the membrane. Then it changes shape again. Another solute goes in. Another ATP comes along. And pump changes shape and spits the uh, the solute out on the other side of the membrane and the same thing happens again and again and so on and so you can see that what's happening is the particles are moving increasingly from lower and lower um, concentration towards higher and higher concentration and this is active transport, moving substances from lower concentration to higher concentration, going up that concentration gradient. OK, now this is a really important process. Um, there are quite a few examples. One big example is the way that plants absorb minerals from the soil. So we know that plants need minerals. The concentration of minerals in the soil is often very low. So they have these cells called root hair cells on their roots, and they absorb those mineral ions from low concentration using active transport. You can see that here, these green particles are the minerals, and there's a very low concentration in that brown soil, and they're going towards higher concentration inside those root hair cells. Similarly, all of us in our intestines, um, the concentration of glucose in our blood is higher than it is in the liquid in our intestines where we're digesting our food. And so the small intestine will absorb that glucose by active transport. So you can see these blue sugar molecules here are going from low concentration in the intestines towards higher concentration in the blood. And so again, we need active transport to do that. Okay, so that's it. The end. As always, thank you for listening and well done if you got this far.